Yeah, I'm, I'm a historian, really. So uh, I was just saying uh, to, to John there and to Colin, it's hard to keep up with. I mean, are you enjoying the shenanigans? It's hard to keep up every minute, every hour. There's another term. Um, but I mean, we, we are, we are as, as other speakers were saying, seeing history uh, being written you know, right now. It's fascinating as a historian to see this. What I've been asked to do by Mary is just very briefly for 10 minutes uh, talk about reflections on this as a historian of modern Ireland. I mean, I've, I've written several books on modern Ireland, Ireland in the 20th century, Anglo-Irish or British-Irish relations, if you like. And so five points, really, uh, on what's happening now regards Brexit, Ireland, the border, from a historical perspective. And the first of my reflections is this, that it's very disappointing uh, to see the rhetoric that's emerged over the last two or three years regards Ireland. And I'm going to have uh, three people who I'd like to point to in particular and, and hold up uh, uh, who I think are responsible for really bringing down the rhetoric on this, especially historically speaking. And the first of those is uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Mm -hmm. I think Rees-Mogg has been responsible for <coughs> ramping up the sort of rhetoric we haven't seen since the 1930s in British-Irish relations. Between 32 and 38, you had an Anglo-Irish trade war, which was disastrous for the Irish economy. It wasn't very good for the British economy either. Rees-Mogg, in his inimitable way, because you know, he's often described as the honourable member for the 18th century, has reached back, reached back about 90 years, and sort of, uh, back in August 2018, the spectre of a trade war, again. Uh, a tremendously irresponsible, I don't have time to talk about that at length, but it was echoed then a few months later by Priti Patel. Priti Patel threatened not just the trade war going back to the 1930s, but uh, implied that, that in the negotiations with the EU and Ireland, Food should be withheld from Ireland. You know, the, the historical parallels are very obvious, going back to the 1840s to the Irish famine. Um, and these things do matter. It's not just historians who view these as footnotes. They, they really do matter, especially for a young nation like Ireland. Very important. I, I found it particularly disappointing from Patel, um, which comes from an Indian background, that she's, you know, Secretary of State for International Development, that she'd come out with something like that. Although she did say she was somewhat misquoted. But also Karen Bradley. I think we, we can't pass on this one, I mean, this is the Northern Ireland Secretary. Now, everybody knows that's a poison chalice, let's be honest. But, you know, to come out with some of the stuff she's come out with, the uh, inability to realise that, you know, in Northern Ireland, which she's responsible for, Catholics tend to vote for nationalist parties and Protestants for unionists, I thought was, it was just incredible. But I think more worryingly than that, whatever you think about the recent verdict in the Bloody Sunday inquiry, she effectively tried to interfere with due process a, a, a few weeks ago in terms of her comments on that, which I'm not going to go into in any depth, but I thought were tremendously worrying. So the rhetoric, I think, that's my first point, has really gone down a few notches. It's very disappointing historically. The second thing is the backstop uh, and the Good Friday Agreement. Now, the Good Friday Agreement has really been hung out to dry in all of this. I think the Good Friday Agreement, no progressive historian of modern Ireland or modern British-Irish relations like myself could help but look at the 1998 Agreement as something which was tremendously positive not just for what it ag agreed at the time, but for what it meant in terms of the further things that came from that, in terms of policing. So, so you know, from then on, Catholics did join the PSNI. Uh, in terms of power sharing, I think these are tremendously positive things. Because the Good Friday Agreement established uh, that principle that those communities would come together. And I'm afraid if you do look at the history of Northern Ireland, it was for much of its existence a sectarian state. If you were Catholic, you were a second-class citizen. The Good Friday Agreement was such a breath of fresh air in, uh, in, in going against that uh, sort of march of history. And I think it's really disappointing that that's been hung up to dry uh, in this whole Brexit debate, which is just bringing down everything with it. So the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, I'll go back to that, and I know some of the later speakers are going to talk about that as well. Thirdly, and it's a point that's been made by many, many people, is the geography of the border. You know, 310 miles of border... That border, which was established, let's remember, you know, in the wake of the, second, of the First World War, you know, all around Europe in the wake of the First World War, there were being borders drawn up, there were being lines drawn on maps, which didn't really work. They were imperfect. That border created, and there's a lot of history attached to it, and there's a context of an Irish war of independence, I know that, there's a context of the war, but that border really was very imperfect. And what it created uh, was a state which functioned for much of its existence as a sectarian entity, I'm afraid. And I think we have to uh, face up to that fact. Now, the attitude from Dublin was not always as progressive as it is today. And of course you had the spectre of Irish Republican paramilitaries. 
But that very border on what it established was always problematic, even going back to the 1930s and to the 1940s. I wrote a book about Ireland in the Second World War and about one chapter about smuggling along that border. And that's just one of the issues which shows the, the, the uh, absurdity of that land border. Because over such a small stretch of land, you have a winding 310-mile uh, border. You know, that you're familiar with the old stories of a farmer having, you know, part of his outbuildings and one half and part in the other. There's, you know, I've gone over the files from Kew and from Belfast and from Dublin. The ridiculous situations where farmers had to sort of get taxed for certain cows sitting in a certain field and all the rest. But a lot of that stuff belongs to a sort of almost stage Irish genre, doesn't it? You know, it's the famous, uh, it's been told in many iterations in many contexts, about you know, smugglers' yarns. There's a guy uh, during the, the emergency of the Second World War who was smuggling something that the, the Northern Ireland border official knew he was smuggling something as he, as he went on his bicycle past him every day, wasn't sure what it was. At the end of the war, what were you smuggling? Bicycles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they almost belong to a sort of stage Irish genre, which belies the actual fact that that border is the site of, you know, going back to the 50s and the IRA's border campaign to 62, right up to the modern troubles with the provisional IRA into the 70s and 80s of death, you know, and, and, and just very nasty situations in terms of the, the physical uh, sensation. I remember as a kid crossing that border, uh, customs officials, the army, etc. The geography of that border doesn't make sense, and that's all the more reason why that border needs to remain open for traders, for locals, uh, for the sake of peace. Fourthly, we're pointing towards some kind of conclusion is this idea of the return to violence. Now, the return to violence and the threat of the return to violence should never be used as any excuse against the democratic process. We had the awful spectre last week of the Tory extreme right talking about some kind of, perhaps, or sort of mooting the idea of some kind of on the streets, uh, blue shirts, they were called, Again, with complete lack of understanding of history in terms of the British black shirts, the Irish fascists were called the blue shirts who went to fight in Spain, but some kind of street based movement to ensure Brexit actually happens. And I hear this a lot that, you know, if Brexit isn't fulfilled, there'll be riots in the street, there'll be violence, there'll be another incident like Joe Fox. That, could never, that can never be allowed to be used as an excuse for anything. And just in the same token, the threat of the return to IRA violence, of whatever brown offshoot of the IRA, should not be used. Uh, as an excuse in any way, shape, or form in these negotiations. However, we do have the, the, the spectre now, incredibly, you know, as a historian, disappointingly, after everything that 1998 and everything after delivered, of the bomb in Derry, which almost killed people uh, as they're out for, for a Saturday night, with various different things, parcel bombs, hijackings, and all the rest. And it's just depressing to see this kind of thing return. Frankly, I don't think the, the, the threat of violence is as significant as it once was. I don't think the current offshoots of the IRA have the same hardware as the provisionals did in the 1980s. But nonetheless, how have we come to this state of play where that is now you know, returning to our screens as, a, as, as, as something that is a legitimate threat? Finally, I think the reality of the DUP is finally sinking home to Theresa May. Uh, the DUP is not the UUP. The UUP, uh, in many ways, were a lot more easy to deal with. Uh, in some ways, with the DUP and indeed with Sinn Féin, and probably your excuse the expression, you have the lunatics running the asylum in Northern Ireland. The DUP were never going to be relied upon. I think maybe uh, Theresa May is realising this in terms of um, reaching out now across the House today, but the, the, the reliance for the last two years upon her hard right and the DUP, who were, let's remember, the only party, the only significant political movement to oppose the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 has, I think, produced with it some very irresponsible rhetoric, some rhetoric around the union and the integrity of the union, which is fair enough. But let's remember the British government's obligations under the Good Friday Agreement, which, you know, in, in, back in 98, were seen as, in good faith, acting as an honest broker. Now, if you're up in Northern Ireland and you're part of the nationalist community and you see all this pandering to the DUP, plus the one billion bribe, by the way, I mean, there, there's just a, there's some, so much damage has been done for the British government's role. I mean, the, 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 the apology of whatever we might, we might think of David Cameron, I'm waiting for the booze and jeers. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, apology, the apology for a bloody Sunday, even as recently as that, you know, did a lot to repair those kind of relations in nationalist communities. You know, in the last two, three years, especially the last two years since that disastrous 2017 election, that's been undone by this close alliance with the DUP, who uh, are not the sort of, you know, Kind of progressive parliamentary force, you, you know, you can you can sort of make deals with. 
So, very, very quick uh, ten minute there, ramble through history, and I'm sorry to end on a very depressing note, but it really seems to me in the last two, three years we have had the ghosts of the past, uh, you know, get dug up again in so many ways, whether that's trade wars, famine, smuggling, you know, trade conflicts during the emergency. The threat of uh, Ireland being starved has been used, you know, for many years, not just the famine. Churchill used it in the Second World War. These things die hard, and to see them return, and the threat of violence return in particular is, I'm afraid, as a modern Irish historian, very, very depressing. However, um, well, I'm sort of loath to say this because of all the twists and turns, perhaps now we might be seeing uh, a glimmer of hope. Perhaps uh, maybe we can live in hope. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you.